Prosper Log, show date 140809. How's everybody done? Well, got a lot going on right now, so we got to get this thing going. This week's log entry brought to you by the folks over at Beer and Song of the Day. Facebook.com slash Beer and Song of the Day, all one word. If you can't spell that, well, pfft, you ain't no business being out here. Alright, let's get started. Today's beverage of choice is this guy, Trappistus Brockford. Belgian beer, 11.3%. Cheers and beers to you all. I ain't gonna waste time in the glass. I got too much going on. Cheers and beers. Or as the Klingons might say, kaplach. Let's get the show started, show started, shall we? First birthday for the week, Helena Swiderski. I worked with your husband in Germany. Lena, congratu congratulations on baby pie, and happy birthday. All right, next on the list, my own neighbor here on Earth Station, Okinawa, Brooks Dorsey. Brooks, my friend, how you doing? Hope everything, hope everything was good for you on your birthday. I'll drink one with you. Alright. Excuse me. Next on the list, this is a guy I have yet to meet in person, but he is, he actually lives up on mainland Japan, Jesse the Body Rubens. What I know of him, he is, like me, a fellow Colts fan. Jesse, my friend, hope your birthday was good. Cheers. All right. Next on the list. This young lady I went to high school with, Tara Ramey. Tara, how you doing? I hope everything's going good for you. I just saw recently that you and your husband, David, are celebrating 10 years of marriage. I give that the prosper salute. Cheers. Next on the list, this is another girl I went to high school with on the 6th, uh, her birthday was on the 6th, Sarah Griffith, I knew her as Sarah Snowden, Sarah how you doing, hope your birthday was good, I, cheers, alright, next on the list, another gal, she was a, she was a couple years ahead of me in school, Melissa Guffey, Melissa how you doing? Hope everything's hope life's treating you well. And Melissa, I hope you're drinking one of these with me. <sighs> Next on the list. This is a guy I knew in England. Good old Lauren Ladson. Lauren, how you doing, boss? Hope life's treating you well. I understand you're at Bible camp right now. Hopefully, you're discovering some of this stuff. Cheers to you. Next up on the list, Michael Renault. Mikey, how you doing, buddy? Haven't seen you in a while. Hope life's treating you well. Mikey, cheers and beers to you, my friend. Now, Mike and I went to high school together, graduated together. We basically grew up together. This guy's all right. Mike, cheers. Last but not least, excuse me, my uncle on my stepdad's side, Max Riggs. Uncle Max, how you doing? I saw recently where uh, saw recently where Aaron got married. Congratulations to her. Congratulations to you. Cheers and beers. All right, some extra shot, some extra greetings. Now this guy, this guy has a, this guy has a web series, a, a Star Trek based web series. His name's John Broughton. He plays Captain Jack Carter of the Starship Farragut. And they just recently put out a new episode called Conspiracy of Innocence. John, here's to you keeping Gene Roddenberry's vision of Star Trek alive, albeit on the Farragut. 
I give you the prosperous salute. All right. Shout outs are done. Let's move on to notable Trek birthdays. You wouldn't know it unless you knew some of the backstory, but actress Lucille Ball. She was born on August 6, 1911. Sadly, she's no longer with us. Passed away April 29th, 1989. If she were alive today, she'd be 103 years old. If it weren't for Lucille Ball, Star Trek would have never gotten a second pilot and therefore would have never gotten a chance to be on TV. Lucille, thank you for swaying the execs at NBC, getting Star Trek on the air. I drink to you. August 7th, child actor Sirach Lofton. He played Jake Sisko, the son of Commander slash Captain Benjamin Sisko of Deep Space Nine. He is 36. And last but not least, August 9th, actor Eric Bana. He played the Romulan Nero, the one that created that god-awful J.J. Abrams verse. Star Trek movie series. He's 46. He's a good actor, but whew, I don't know. Cheers to y'all. Alright, I gotta get going. I gotta, I gotta get going. Let's look at upcoming football action. Hey, it's still preseason, but you know what? It's football. Excuse me. Coming up on August 14th, we got Jacksonville at Chicago. Who am I rooting for? The Bears. Got to go with the Bears, man. August 15th, Philadelphia at New England. There is one thing, one thing I cannot stand more than people drinking and driving. It's the New England Patriots. Always got to root for Philadelphia. You want to know what I think of New New England? That's it. Tennessee at New Orleans. Uh-uh. Go with New Orleans. I can't root for Tennessee. They're in our division. San Diego at Seattle. I can go with Seattle on this one. Sorry, not a big San Diego fan. Detroit at Oakland. I'm pulling for Detroit on this one. And on the 16th, looking at Green Bay at St. Louis, going with the Packers. New York Giants in Indianapolis. Now, y'all know how I... In case, for some of you that... For those of you that don't know how I feel, I'm, I'm a Manning fan. And there's only two times I'm going to root against Eli Manning. When he's playing his brother Peyton, and when he's playing my Colts. I will never, ever root against the Colts. Never. New York Jets at Cincinnati. No way I'm rooting for the Jets. Cincinnati all the way. Baltimore at Dallas. This one was tough. Even though I know they're going to choke, I'm rooting for Dallas. Buffalo at Pittsburgh. I got to go with Buffalo on that one. Miami at Tampa Bay. I am not rooting for Tampa Bay. They, they're another team in our division. Miami it is. Atlanta at Houston. Same thing. Going with Atlanta. And Arizona at Minnesota. Got to go with the cards. Sorry, they may, they may have taken our offensive coordinator, but you know what? I don't care. I'm still rooting for Arizona. Now, let's get to the big part of the show. What, what Prosper is all about. This week's Star Trek episode, The Enemy Within. The Enterprise is on a survey mission of Planet Alpha 177. Crewman gets injured, transports aboard the ship. What they don't know is that when he transported aboard the ship, the transporter was damaged. And, but they didn't discover it until after Captain Kirk had beamed aboard and was duplicated. Basically, it's a cat and mouse game between good Kirk and evil Kirk. We also learn that Spock has a, has a half-human side, as if we didn't know it already. Basically, the, the main plot, Kirk versus Kirk. But what makes it what makes this show interesting is that it had a B story, B story of the landing party 
trapped on the planet, facing death. At the end of the episode, Captain Kirk is reunited with his, the good Kirk is reunited with evil Kirk. The landing party is saved. That was Kirk. He could have gotten away with it too if he'd just been smarter about it. All right, let's go behind the scenes. Grace Lee Whitney recounts that while shooting the scene when a distraught, tearful Janice Rand accuses Captain Kirk of trying to rape her, William Shatner slapped her across the face to get her to register the proper emotion. As they shot the rape scene days earlier, Whitney couldn't get into the same emotion successfully, and it was Shatner's solution to the problem. Hey, if it worked, this is what I gotta say to it. Good on you for thinking about it, but for slapping a woman, that's it. Writer Richard Matheson's main influence on writing this episode was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, as he envisioned Robert Louis Stevenson's classic story in a science fiction context. He eventually came up with the idea of the transporter causing a man to be split into two halves. Good idea. It worked. The subplot of Sulu and three other crew members stranded on the planet were not present in Matheson's original script and was added in staff rewrites. Matheson did not like the idea as he explained, I hate beast stories. They truly slow the story down. My script stayed entirely with Bill Shatner having this trouble of his two selves on the ship. They added a whole subplot about people down on the planet ready to freeze to death because they had a transporter functioning problem. I stuck entirely with Bill. You may have hated B stories, but hey, this one worked. The last two scenes of Act 1 are switched in order from what ha what appears in the script. In the teleplay, Kirk and Spock learn about the assault of Janice in sickbay, then head to the transporter room, where they are faced with this, the discovery that the transport is creating duplicates. The act ends with Scotty suggesting we don't dare beam up the landing party. If this should happen to a man, and Kirk's, oh my god. In the episode itself, the sick bay scene follows the one in the transporter room, and the act ends with Spock declaring, There's only one conclusion. We have an imposter aboard. Director Leo Penn was known to reorganize scenes when he deemed them to be more dramatic in a different order from what was scripted. It worked. Uh oh, empties the brain cells the average Patriots fan. Always come prepared. Cheers. In the teaser, as Kirk and Sulu discuss the impending temperature drop, an, an offstage voice, ostensibly the director's, can be heard yelling, Noise! as the sound effect of falling rocks starts on the soundtrack. This is the cue Shatner and Takei to react to the sound of Technician fa Fisher falling from the rock face off screen. The transporter was depicted as the only mode of, of transport between a planet and the ship because the episode was written and filmed before the existence of the hangar deck and the shuttle and shuttlecraft were established. You'd figure a big ship like the Enterprise would have shuttles. No. In the long shots of Kirk stalking his double in engineering, the double is seen brandishing a Type 1 hand phaser, but in close-ups he carries a Type 2 pistol phaser. Really? Come on, get it straight, stupid. In the sequence of aired episodes, this is the first episode where we see or hear the new middle initial for James Kirk. Captain James T. Kirk is briefly visible as the, re as the negative Kirk enters Kirk's quarters. The initial was first spoken in Mud's Women, but that episode aired after The Enemy Within. In the latter part of the scene, where the two Kirks appear together on the bridge, a close-up shot of the negative Kirk shows the scratches on the right side of his face, although wider shots in all earlier scenes showed they were on the left side. This was due to the shot being reversed during editing. Director 
Director Leo Pin and cameraman Jerry Finnerman mistakenly filmed the close-up out of Axis, breaking the 180-degree rule, and editor Fabian Torsman could only help by reversing it, hoping the audience wouldn't notice the resulting continuity error. We caught it. Actress Grace Lee Whitney was very unhappy about the last scene in this episode, in which Spock asks Yeoman Rand if the imposter had some very interesting the imposter had some very interesting qualities, wouldn't you say, Yeoman? In her autobiography, she wrote, I can't imagine any more cruel excuse me, and insensitive comment a man or Vulcan could make to a woman who has just been through a sexual assault. But then some women really, some men really do think that women want to be raped. So the writer of the script, ostensibly Richard Matheson, although the line could have been added by Gene Roddenberry or an assistant scribe, gives us a leering, where am I at? Gives us a leering Mr. Spock who suggests that Yeoman Rand enjoyed being raped and found the evil Kirk attractive. I'm not going to touch it. At the start of the episode, when Kirk is beamed up from Alpha 177, both he and his evil counterpart are missing the Enterprise insignia on their uniforms. This part of the badge. Lieutenant Farrell is also missing his insignia at some points during the episode, and also in a shot recycled from this episode in Mud's Women. The Star Trek compendium suggests that the insignias were removed early every time the uniforms were cleaned. Union rules required them to be cleaned daily. And during production of this episode, someone forgot to put them back to Kirk and Farrell's uniforms. Idiots. If I forget something, I get fired. Or worse, I go to jail. This episode introduced the first season version of the Captain's Wraparound Tunic. It reappears in Charlie X and Court Martial, and in Kirk's briefcase in This Side of Paradise. It was originally made with the purpose of differentiating Kirk from his double in this episode. Actress, although Nichelle Nichols does not appear in this episode, her voice is heard on the intercom in several scenes. This episode marks the first time on screen that Kirk is duplicated in some form or fashion. This repeats again through What Are Little Girls Made Of, Whom Gods Destroy, and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Spock's log entry in this episode calls himself Second Officer Spock. However, in Court Martial, the computer lists him as First Officer Spock, and from then on is referred to as First Officer until his return in Star Trek The Motion Picture as simply Science Officer Spock. This was the, this was the first episode of the show... This was the first episode to show the Vulcan nerve pinch as well as the first time McCoy says, He's dead, Jim. Leonard Nimoy objected to the script's directive that Spock KOs, KOs the evil Kirk on the head, so he improvised the neck pinch on the spot and demonstrated it on William Shatner for director Leo Penn. In this episode, we get to follow Kirk behind the large engine room machinery components in the first trip to the engineering deck which dialogue identifies as being in the lowest parts of the ship. To allow this to happen, the, the new set had to be temporarily expanded to hide the soundstage beyond it. After the double is rendered unconscious by the first neck pinch in the series, the quickly assembled wall behind the three characters can be observed to have a very rough edge where it meets the floor. Pieces of sets that were designed to be added and subtracted easily were called wild. <laughs> Although Kirk pursues Ben Finney into these components in Court Martial, this is the only time we get to see the space behind them. The view of the tube structures behind the grill was a forced perspective set. Tube machinery appears to be many dozens of meters long, 
but this is an illusion created by making each vertical pipe much smaller than the one in front of it. Diminishing, diminishing numbers were later printed on the tubes immediately behind the, gr the grid to add to the illusion. Excuse me. In episodes where the engines were under stress, lighting effects were used inside the tube machinery room. The set was extensively remodeled between the first and second seasons. A shot showing two extras, Frank Da Vinci and Ron Vito, in red technician's jumpsuits, and Vita holding the aforementioned cutie pie prop in the engineering set was filmed, but cut from the episode. It was probably filmed as an insert shot for scenes in engineering. The gauzy red bordered triangular set piece behind which the evil Kirk emerges briefly in engineering during the hunt scene appears to have been left over from the early briefing room as seen in The Cage and Where No Man Has Gone Before. The unit that the evil Kirk accidentally phasers in engineering was recycled as the housing for the main circulating pump for the, PK, for the PXK per GM reactor in The Devil in the Dark. Showering phaser effect when Sulu heats the rock is never used again. Just before he sprays the rocks, Sulu also appears to be fitting his hand phaser into its pistol mount again, a maneuver that is also never repeated. There are two split screens used, after Kirk's double is neck pinched and in sickbay, when he takes the hand of his counterpart. All other instances of the two Kirks appearing in the same shot were done using doubles. I had another sheet around here somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? Finally, this episode marks the last appearance of all three female leads in the series, Lieutenant Uhura, Nurse Chapel, and Yeoman Rand, until Star Trek The Motion Picture. There's an imposter aboard the station. What? A man who looks just like me and is pretending to be me. This man is dangerous. Caution is to be observed. All personnel are to arm themselves. Better hurry up and drink. The imposter may be identified by scratches on his face. Repeat. The imposter may be identified by scratches on his face. Section Chief. Shit. Assigned personnel to the search. Told you I didn't have much time. All search parties. Report to Lieutenant Commander Love, Doctor. Damn it. <clears throat> Excuse me. All phasers to be set to stun. The imposter is not to be injured. Use minimum force. Repeat. <clears throat> the imposter is not to be injured. Commander out. Excuse me. Oh. Told y'all I didn't have much time. I gotta get out of here. Um, don't drink and drive. Don't root for the Patriots. Live long and prosper.